If we haven't met, my name is Chris, and I am an imperfect follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I can tell by the smile on some of your faces, that is a familiar phrase that we've heard from time again. Now, if it's your first Sunday, I, po- I started with a, an inside joke, which was horribly rude of me, um, because that means that there would be some people on the outside, so I apologize. That is a, a little, a little um, inside tip of the hat. You know, a few months ago, our lead pastor, Brady White, came and said that he had accepted a job at Mosaic Church in Orlando, Florida. And this is our first Sunday while Brady is in Orlando. And I wanted to make sure that I come up here. You're going to hear a lot of, of things that, that come from Brady's heart in our message today. And I wanted to make sure that it's not, we, he's not here. We recognize that. It doesn't need to be awkward. We recognize that, that God called him to the oppressive heat that is Florida, right? And then in God's grace and providence, Brady shared some of that oppressive heat with us this coming week. Um, so Brady will be hard to forget in many ways. Um, and I know that, you know, we've been texting like, like way too much. Brady and I have been texting way too much this last week just as a way to stay connected and to encourage each other as we're both in, in different positions. But um, here we are. Brady is in Orlando and we're here in Quincy and we're continuing on. Continuing on. A lead pastor change is never fun. It's never fun. There are always a lot of emotions. Sometimes there's sadness. There's anger, confusion, maybe even suspicion, or maybe expectancy. You see, we're at a kind of a crossroads here at LifePoint. And if it is your first time, and if, you, if you're just checking out LifePoint, this is a great Sunday to be here because we're going to talk a little bit as a faith family this morning. You're going to get a flavor for this community, I pray and I hope. Because, see, we're kind of at a crossroads. We're, the first of the year, we, we're debt-free. We don't owe anybody any money. We paid off the building. That's where you clap. That'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've got this opportunity. There's, there's $100,000 in our budget every year moving forward that we are praying, how is God going to ask us to leverage those monies for His glory, for His kingdom? We asked you guys to be praying about that, to be praying, how will, will God leverage those funds? How will we steward those monies for His glory? And we're doing some intentional things. We've got something tomorrow night. We've got some intentional things that we're doing. And to, to hear from you guys and to hear, how has the Spirit led you guys? How has the Spirit led us as a faith family in that direction? We've like I said, we've seen a lot of change on our staff. J- Jason Bennett's back from his three-month sabbatical. It is so good to have Jay back. It is so good to have Jay back. We made a really, really difficult change in student ministry. And like I said, Brady's back in, he's down in Florida. Lots of things going on here. Lots of things going on with our staff. We've, you know, we've, we've heard from you. Many of you have, have, have told us, hey, his, this is where I feel the Spirit is leading us with the money that we usually pay to the building loan. This is where I feel that, that that's going to go. We've seen Chelsea and Joseph Kim, Gabby Pratt, Jeremy Holt, Jenny Vandevelde double down as our youth volunteers to really come alongside and love our students this summer. And I'm excited to see how God begins to move through them and our, all of our students. The elders have they've asked me to kind of stand in the gap, giving us time to seek God's guidance for what comes next regarding the lead pastor. And I'll kind of serve in that role this summer, and then we'll see how the Spirit is led. And I guarantee we'll follow His prompting. So that means that you'll see me teaching more here on Sundays, but but you're going to hear from other people as well. I believe firmly in the plurality of the pulpit. I believe it is good for us to hear from other people regularly. We're still going to have great music. I mean, you know? And it's music that proclaims God's glory, not our own. 
LifePoint Kids is still going to be growing strong. I think if I did the math, Camp Epic is like seven weeks away. Begin preparing yourselves, right? Camp Epic, looking for men's ministry, student ministry, women's ministry, life group, soul care nights, go trip, baptism Sundays coming up, chapter one. It's one of the most beautiful things about LifePoint. As a guy who's been here from, from the beginning, is one of the most beautiful things. We have never been about a personality. We have never been about a certain pastor. LifePoint is about two things. Hear me. LifePoint is about two things, the Word of God and Jesus Christ. Those two things will never, never change. We will continue to open God's Word and proclaim His Son, Jesus Christ, and the salvation that is found only through Him. To that end, I saw so many of you, I'm going to disappoint you already. I saw so many of you walk in with your Acts journals. We're not going to be in Acts for just one Sunday, but if you want to grab your Acts journals and take a note, next Sunday we're hopping right back into the story of the Bible, walking through Acts again. We're going to be in, we're going to be in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, through eight, chapter 8, verse 4. Go ahead and read it. Get ready. Prepare your hearts as we encounter Stephen and the martyrdom and the spreading of the church. It has a direct effect of what happened so long ago, brought the gospel to us. I'm a little excited about it. But this morning, we're going to stop, and we're going to pause, and we're just going to sit in one verse. We're just going to sit in, in one verse together. We're going to look at some other ones, but I just want to sit in one verse. And we're going to have that verse up on the screen. So grab your Bibles, if you have them, or your phone, and open up to 2 Timothy 2.8. Strategically, 2 Timothy comes after 1 Timothy, so if, you, if you're looking for it. That's right. I went to Bible college. Um, I heard one person say, and I'm going to say this to you guys tonight, as we get started, if I say something that you agree with and you verbally respond by saying amen, I will not be offended. I will not be offended. Matter of fact, I just might be encouraged. 2 Timothy 2.8 says this, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached, in my gospel. I'm going to read it a second time, and if you're willing, will you read it with me? Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer and in song and declare your glory. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We declare that you are holy, holy, holy. And may our time together, may you receive the glory in our time together. And Jesus, may you be proclaimed. Spirit, help us to be dependent upon you. Open up our heart and our ears to what we would encounter. And may it result in obedience. May it result in us proclaiming your glory to all that we encounter. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, <clears throat> our sentence this morning is written by a man, man named Paul. Paul, who was Saul, the persecutor of the Jews, who had had this come to Jesus moment on the road to Damascus that we're going to talk about next month in the book of Acts. I'm really excited about it. Who wrote 13 or 14 books of the Bible, depending on who you who you talked to, who planted like 14 churches on his three missionary journeys, who'd been arrested three times. Paul calls himself earlier um, in this letter the Lord's prisoner as he writes this letter from a jail cell. Paul is incarcerated in, what's, in what one scholar called a dismal underground dungeon with a hole in the ceiling for light and air. He wrote this, this letter as he was in chains, as the verse after that we'll look at later attests. You see, the preliminary hearing of of Paul's criminal case that had already taken place, and Paul assumes that he's in trouble. Paul assumes that he's going to be put to death, which we learn later he is beheaded for his faith in Christ and the proclamation of him. Paul is writing this letter to his protege, Timothy, hence the name of the book, Timothy. For over 15 years, Timothy had been Paul's faithful faithful missionary companion. He had traveled with Paul during his second and third missionary journeys, and he had been 
He had been sent as a trusted delegate to other places like Thessalonica and, and Corinth. And Timothy, Timothy was with Paul his, the first time he was arrested. And it's not just that Paul has this strong affection as, of, for Timothy as, as a friend, but he'd grown to trust Timothy as, and Paul writes, as a fellow worker, a brother, God's servant in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of Timothy's genuine concern for the church and the people of God and, and because of the loyalty with which the Bible says, as a son with a father, that he had served with Paul, right? Paul could go so far as to write about Timothy saying he has, he has no one like him. And here's the point. Paul and Timothy's relationship is unique. It is unique. Paul, it, it is different than Paul's relationship with anyone else. Paul knows him so well. And from these two letters that he writes to Timothy, we can learn a lot about Timothy too. We know he's young. We know that he knew the Scriptures early, early in his life from his mother and his grandmother. We knew that, knew that he probably came to faith through Paul. We know that Paul discipled him. We know that he's a pastor, he's a gifted, he's a godly man. We know that Timothy was an evangelist, he was a missionary. We tell, we're told that, that he was in prison for his witness for Christ. So why? Why at the end of his life write a letter to Timothy? Why would Paul do that and say, hey, remember Jesus? Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached in my gospel. Why tell a pastor a missionary, an evangelist, a man taught the Scriptures early in his life, a man that you personally discipled. Why write a letter and say, hey, remember Jesus Christ? At a conference that I, I went to a few months ago, Speaker Shai Lin answered this question of why by saying the answer is in the reality of suffering. The, why, the answer to the why is in the reality of suffering. The context of Paul's letters to Timothy proved that answer to be valid. Paul writes from a Roman prison, suffering. 2 Timothy 1.8 says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Or 2 Timothy 1.11 and 12, For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. 2 Timothy 2 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And then our verses, along with the, along with the verse 9, 2 Timothy 2 8 and 9, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. Shailen said this Why does the reality of suffering? necessitate the exhortation to remember Jesus Christ? Well, that's because suffering has a way of intensifying our natural tendency, our natural tendency to forget God. When we suffer, it's so easy for us to take our eyes off of God and fix them on whatever or whoever is causing our suffering. Now, before we go on, I recognize that chained in a dark prison cell for proclaiming your, your faith and life point being at a crossroads and dealing with a lot of change, that ain't apples to apples, right? Let's not consider those two things the same, but I want to look past the horrible comparison, and I apologize for it, but I want to, I want to show you a truth this morning. I resonate with what Shailen is saying. I resonate when we suffer. It's so easy for us to take our eyes off of God and fix it and fix them on whatever or whoever is causing our suffering. As we stand at a crossroads as a church here at Life Point, we have things, as we have things changing all around us, and some of us are feeling sadness, anger, confusion. Some of us are physically sick and hurting. Some of us have children that are physically sick and hurting. Some of us have big decisions in front of us. We have lost friends and colleagues. In our, there are just change all around us in our lives, in our church, and in our nation. Many of, listen, many of us have life so loud, so loud in front of us that it's so easy to take our eyes off God and fix them on the volume that we're surrounded by. 
I resonate with what Shylin is saying. I understand why Paul is exhorting Timothy to remember Jesus Christ in the chaos, in the noise, in our sinful nature. Sometimes we can forget Jesus. Check out this picture I got for you. That's Old Faithful. The guys are at Yellowstone National Park. The water that erupts from Old Faithful has been uh, measured at 204 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam that emits from this geyser has been measured at over 350 degrees Fahrenheit. 8,400 gallons of water comes, I said spewing last, it comes erupting, I don't know if I can say that, comes erupting out of there, 8,400 gallons of water. Old Faithful currently erupts around 20 times a day and can be predicted with a 90% confidence rate within a 10-minute variation based on the duration and height of the previous eruption. It's like planet Earth right here. When visiting Yellowstone, you got to go see Old Faithful. you got to go see it, right? It's a, it's a must-see, but that's not what I want you to see in this picture. I do not want you to see the geyser itself. I want you to look to the left. Did you see that building? See that building to the left? That's Old Faithful Lodge. And here's a picture from inside the dining room at Old Faithful Lodge where you can have breakfast and watch Old Faithful just do, do his thing. And it's great. And Old Faithful is so predictable that the people eating, they get up and they leave their table and they go over to those huge bay windows and they got their waffle and they're just like, wow, that's really cool. And then they all go and they sit back down. But there are some people that don't hustle over to the window. There are some people that don't even pay attention to this incredible thing. They don't even glance over at the giant 8,400 gallons of water at 350 degrees just feet away. They're busy. They're busy delivering drinks. They're busy bringing out food. They're busy clearing plates and dishes. They've seen it all a hundred times. When you work at Old Faithful Lodge, Old Faithful isn't that exciting. As Paul writes to Timothy, Life Point, let me use his words to say to us this morning. Life Point, remember Jesus Christ. Risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in Paul's gospel, things can get, things can get lost in plain sight. 8,400 gallons of water can get lost in plain sight. We can catch ourselves coming to church, singing songs, writing checks, bringing laundry detergent and dude, dude wipes, scrubbing the floors, yet missing Jesus Christ. In this in this season here at LifePoint, so many of you, I, I mean, I have had so many of you stop me, text me, reach out, email me and say, hey, how can I help? What, what, can, what can I do during this season? It's, it's a beautiful picture of our faith family we have here at LifePoint. LifePoint for 15 years has always been an all-hands-on-deck place. That'd be where you say Amen. Right? And as you've reached out, I felt God prompt me to answer in a different way than I, than I want to. While I think the natural reaction would be for me to say, hey, I want you to serve more. I want you to, I want you to give more. I want you to be patient. I, w- I, want you to, I want you to trust the leadership of LifePoint. And brothers and sisters, if you want to double down on all those things, you just go right ahead. They're not bad things. They're not bad things. But I want to share with you how I think that I should answer that question. How can I help during this season at LifePoint? And here's how. I want you to remember Jesus Christ. I want you to remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached in Paul's gospel. And here's how I want us to do that. Here's how I want us to consider doing that. I I want us to prioritize our own personal holiness. Prioritize your personal walk with Jesus. Listen, let's walk against the current culture to just show up and be spoon-fed on a Sunday and then go out and get back to our regular lives. Let's take a moment in the history of our church to say today, today I will prioritize my walk with Jesus Christ. Beyond my spouse, 
beyond my children, beyond my comfort. I was reading about a, a Puritan pastor by the name of Joseph, Joseph Aleen, and he got released from prison in 1644 for proclaiming Christ in the, in the country of England, in the county of Somerset. And when he, when he was released, he had this intense, just this intense desire to be consumed with the personal pursuit of holiness. And his wife, who served as his biographer, recall, recalled that he would, and I quote, be much troubled if he heard blacksmiths or other craftsmen at work at their trades before he was at communion with God, saying to me often, how those noise shames me, how those noises shame me, doth not my master deserve more than theirs? I love saying doth. Eileen valued the pursuit of personal holiness so much that he became frustrated when the world began their task before he began his daily pursuit of Jesus. And I, I, now I realize when I'm, I'm throwing around this word, world, this word personal holiness, and I want to define that for you. When we encounter the word holy, I hope for many of us and most of us, our, our first natural inclination is to think about God. And the question is, so Chris wants me to be like God. Oh, okay. Like, let's just get more donuts. Like, that's hard, you know, right? The word holy means to be set apart, being set apart. Holiness is, is God's godness, right? His purity, His difference from His creation. So to be holy is most fundamentally to be like God. And then because Jesus is the, Jesus is the perfect image of God, to, to be holy is to be like Christ. It's holiness is Christ-likeness. Being holy is being like Jesus. I hope you know where I'm going with this. At LifePoint, we talk about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, partnering with Jesus on His mission. And our personal holiness matters. And in my personal opinion, prioritizing our personal holiness is one of the best ways to serve your local church. And let me start with why. Why is it important for us to cultivate personal holiness, godliness, Christ-likeness? Well, for starters, the Bible tells us to. Paul, writing to Timothy again in his first letter, 1 Timothy 4, 7, says this, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Godliness is of value in every way. Look at Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness. Strive with, for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, it's not our striving for holiness that persuades the Lord to let us into heaven. It's the holiness of Christ Himself on our behalf, a holiness credited to us, imputed to us when we're united to Christ by faith, but that's what qualifies us to see the Lord. But godliness is a value in every way. We're to strive for holiness. And those who rely on Christ to make them right with God, who follow Jesus, those who follow Jesus have, have the Holy Spirit within us. God's presence living in us. The Holy Spirit's presence. One author said it, it, He he creates holy hungers and longings for the holy things of God. I am assuming and guessing that since your presence here indicates some holy hungers or longings for the holy things of God. The Apostle Peter, he writes a little bit about what we're talking about. And in, in the book of 2 Peter, there are many themes. One of them is to grow in holiness. Pastor Kevin DeYoung lists 20 things, 20 motivations for holiness in 2 Peter, and I'm just going to share quickly 10 of them with you. 10 quick reasons why it's important to cultivate personal holiness. We pursue, we, we pursue holiness so that we might become partakers of the divine nature. We pursue holiness so that we will not be ineffective or unfruitful in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pursue holiness so we will not be blind, having forgotten that we are cleansed from our former sins. We pursue holiness because Jesus is coming back again, because sin never delivers on its promises, because those who live in their sin, again, are like those returning to slavery, returning to the mirror. We remember to be holy 
So we will not be drawn away by those scoffers who will come in the last days following their own sinful desires. We pursue holiness because all our works will be exposed on the last day because whatever else we live for in this life will be burned up and dissolved. We pursue holiness so that Christ might be glorified both now and to the day of eternity. Aren't you glad I only did 10? So there's a short case for the why. The why for the, a short case for pursuing personal holiness. But let's talk about the how. Because it's great to talk about why we should, but let's talk about how do we get that done. And the first word I want to mention is a word that probably is considered somewhat of a dirty word in our culture. And it's the word discipline. Now, I'm not a picture of personal discipline. I struggle with this. My natural bent is towards the couch. That is where I naturally lean. You see, although the Holy Spirit produces the desire for holiness, progress in holiness isn't automatic. Remember, we looked at 1 Timothy 4, 7, which said, train yourself for godliness. That, that word, the Greek word for train is gumnazo. It probably could be, be translated discipline. Discipline yourself for godliness. The Spirit motivates and enables us to train ourselves, but He doesn't do it for us. He doesn't do it for us. The practical day-by-day obedience to the command is our spirit-empowered, spirit-empowered responsibility. The key to cultivating practical holiness in life is discipline. Intentional, ongoing participation in the God-given means of grace found in God's Word. What we're talking about are the spiritual disciplines. The practices found in Scripture to cultivate personal holiness have been called and known as the spiritual disciplines. Sometimes here at LifePoint, we call them the rhythms of intimacy. So the way we discipline ourselves, so the purpose of holiness, is by practicing the biblical spiritual disciplines or the rhythms of intimacy. We practice those things. And let's just be very clear at this point. The spiritual disciplines found in Scripture are not marks of holiness or godliness in and of themselves. Think of the Pharisees that when we walked through Matthew... These guys were super, super intense on the spiritual disciplines. You think they fasted like twice a week, twice, twice a week, yet Jesus considered them like the epitome of ungodliness, right? The Pharisees, just as many people today, saw the discipline as the ends, not the means. They mistook the practice of spiritual disciplines as holiness, not a path to holiness, Spiritual disciplines are a path to holiness, a never-ending path towards being like Jesus. We never fully become like Christ until our glorification, until heaven. But we're being sanctified this side of eternity as we're growing in our faith, as we're learning more about God's character, as we're being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus. Life point, we prioritize our personal holiness by remembering Jesus Christ through the spiritual disciplines. And some of you, some of you are all over this. Some of you, this this is just markers of your life, right? You've been doing this for years, and that is one of the reasons many of you have such confidence in life point moving forward. You know the God we serve. We serve a God who does not change. We serve a God who created all things. We serve a God that knows the number of hairs on your head. We serve a God that has for us an everlasting love. We serve a God that loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. We serve a God that is rich in mercy, a God that is gracious and full of compassion and righteousness. We serve a God that is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. We serve a God whose love endures forever. We serve a God whose unfailing love for us will not be shaken, his covenant of peace not removed. Romans 8, 38, 39 say this, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of God's love for us in Jesus Christ, we prioritize our personal holiness. And because we don't want to just say, hey, do this, and then not come alongside you as a church, next month we've got a three-week opportunity, 
And we've called it chapter two, and we're going to walk through what does it look like to be with, become like, and partner with Jesus on his mission in community? What does it look like to incorporate the rhythms of intimacy into our own lives, into our lives at home, into our families' lives? And the parents at LifePoint Kids, as your kids, as they come out, they are receiving the first of several rhythms of intimacy cards, a card to help invite your children into this pursuit as well. We, we open up our Bibles, we, we meditate on Scripture, we practice the rhythms of intimacy, we pray for ourselves, others, and our church daily, and we prioritize our personal holiness. As we do that, we share the salvation found in Jesus with others. This is not some narcissistic thing, we're just going to huddle in and we're going to be, hey, we're going to look at personal holiness. That's not what personal holiness is for. Sometimes I like to think, you know, if I'll just get my prayer closet and I'll just close the door and I'll just kind of sit there forever, you know, and we, and, and we do get in that prayer closet. It's a beautiful thing, but friends, you can't stay there. You can't stay there. You've got to kick that prayer door open, and you've got to come out bursting, proclaiming the God you know, the Son you follow, and the Spirit you're filled with. Putting our faith in Jesus Christ, it's a personal moment, but friends, it is not a private journey. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Psalm 65 says, declare His glory among the nations. Our personal holiness is meant to glorify God and point others to Him. And point others to Him. You know, we, I, I, the graphic and the way it makes it look like a cave and it's got that giant remember. I don't know if you have anybody in your life that you remember. Um, whether it's a, it's a grandparent, whether it's a, it's a former teacher, somebody who's super influential, a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, a teacher, but somebody that you, you maybe you've lost or lost connection to. I, mine was my grandfather. His name's Cecil, Cecil Woodard. We should bring that name back. It's a good name. <laughs> Cecil, and I remember things about my oldest cousin. When you're the oldest cousin, you get to name Mimi, Gigi, whatever. He just shortened grandfather to Gran, so we know him as Gran. And I remember a lot of things about Gran. When I think about the word remember, I, re I remember Gran. I remember his patience in teaching me to drive. I remember, I remember his pickup truck, and it had this beautiful, just weird kind of sweet smell, a mixture of juicy fruit chewing gum and red man chewing tobacco. Yes. Yes. You know, I remember his passion for hard work. I remember how excited he would get on Saturday nights because he knew Sunday mornings were coming. I remember when we would sing Blessed Assurance and everybody would turn and look at him as that deep mezzo voice would sing, this is my story, this is my song. As we close, I want to look at our one, our one verse one more time. Look at it one more time. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached in Paul's gospel. Paul tells Timothy, and I believe us this morning, to remember Jesus Christ. But what are we to remember about him? Don't miss this. Risen from the dead. Friends, death has been defeated. Our sins have been forgiven. We are alive through Christ. He has died the death that we deserve and defeated the death upon the cross and risen from the grave. And all God's people said, Amen. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, the long-awaited deliverer. Friends, the Messiah has come as preached in my, Paul's, gospel. Gospel means good news. The good news, the gospel, is that all who call upon the name of the Lord, who put their faith in Jesus, who recognize themselves as a sinner in need of salvation, who repent, turn from their sin and follow Jesus, will be saved, will spend eternity with Jesus, will have everlasting life with God in heaven. In light of this, in light of this, in light of remembering who Jesus is and all that he has done, Life point, we prioritize our personal holiness by remembering Jesus Christ through the spiritual disciplines.